Hi, I'm Sophie Kravitz. I'm here at DEF CON 27 in Las Vegas, Nevada. We came here to talk to hardware and security professionals about their day-to-day -day lives. We're looking to talk to people about IoT, pen testing, and all the security flaws that people find in their everyday devices. So come on, let's go. First stop was at the Hack5 booth to talk with Shannon Morse to get her take on the current state of IoT devices today. Internet of Things is so incredibly accessible to consumers that you see this like inundation of consumer devices constantly with some kind of connection, some kind of accessibility that you can get online and they can do the thing and they're so easy to use, they're just plug and play. So everybody has these IoT devices. So of course, we're all concerned because we're like, oh, if it's connected to the internet, there's likely some kind of vulnerabilities involved there. We should probably figure that out before every single consumer household puts one in their home. Internet of Things devices, I think is a very touchy subject with a lot of security professionals because on the one hand, nobody really wants to regulate anything that has to do with security because you want the ability for the community, for like the hacker community to get involved and to fix these things open source. If there's regulations, that might make things tougher. But with IoT, since we have been inundated with all of these devices constantly for the past couple of years, I have seen a lot more people turn to the idea of having some kind of government regulations in check to make sure that manufacturers know that there needs to be some kind of process involved to make sure these devices are secure before they even get to the market. We spoke with Daryl Hyland, who works as a security researcher. It was great getting an official definition of what IoT is and some of the more common security issues. There, there's a ton of definitions with IoT out there. Uh, the thing is, is they're really bad. Most of them are, are they're, they're not all inclusive. So what I did is I formed a model that covers various traits of IoT. Uh, an IoT ecosystem usually has an embedded technology. It also has a management and control functionality, whether that's a mobile app or a hard app on a, on a server or whatever, or a human and machine interface for you know, an ICS environment. And it also has cloud and API services associated with that. So it helps us actually define if something's IoT or not by saying, hey, does it have all the traits? But the big thing is, is it gives us a better holistic view of all the components that could potentially be impacted by various security issues or vulnerabilities. And of course, the end game, and we're not there yet, is to eventually create tools and stuff that can be leveraged by uh, pen testers, researchers, product testers, to be able to analyze end-to-end -end security by capturing that data, analyzing it, doing replay attacks, can the device attack other devices, and build a whole set of test scenarios that we could possibly build into uh, a testing model. We ran into Fob, who is well known as a knitting machine hacker. We're all really excited about what IoT gadgets can do for us, and she shared some of her thoughts about why we need to be cautious. I think the problematic vector is that some really simple device that you just don't think about and the manufacturer doesn't think about gives an attacker a vector to attack something more serious in your home. So whether that's personal video surveillance, whether that's your lock system for your home. Maybe they're getting bank account information from something that you're surfing on your home private internet and some tiny IoT device that you didn't think twice about and the manufacturer didn't think twice about allows them to have that vector to that most private part of your internet experience, which is online banking. Joe Fitzpatrick was in town to give a security training which included hardware implants. He shared his thoughts on security attacks through common and not so common interfaces. I think the future is a lot of mixed attacks where you use physical access, you use hardware to get software access. Um, so there's a lot of work going on in like US, uh, USB attacks, right? So um, when USB devices beha misbehave, this is changing the way hardware is expected to work and suddenly you can have a, um, a software impact with what the hardware does. Other interfaces that are suddenly more possible to interface with are high-speed interfaces. We've dealt with JTAG, UART, SPY, I2C for a long time. These are easy, they're trivial. The Bus Pirate's been doing this for 10 years. Um, but now we've got um, SATA, we've got PCI Express, we've got USB 3.0. You've got all these protocols that are speaking in the gigahertz range. From an electrical perspective, when you have a low-speed interface, you can stick a probe on there, 
and observe it with a logic analyzer, with a oscilloscope, whatever tool turns out to be the right tool for the job. But when you switch to a high-speed interface, just the act of putting a probe on there adds enough capacitance to the line that the data, the communication link doesn't work anymore. Um, so you need uh, finely tuned equipment, um, you know, expensive probes and um, uh, buffering, you know, probes and active probes for logic analyzers. We saw this very interesting device with a bunch of antennas on it. So we asked the creator, Josh Conway, to show us how it works. Those, the, the dongles that plug in from those wireless keyboards and mice have a dongle that plugs into your computer. Uh, those things act like a keyboard and a mouse. Even though they're wireless, they act like that on the computer side. So, and it transmits 2.4 gigahertz wireless uh, to and from the keyboard to that little dongle on the computer. So I can, one, listen in on that signal. Uh, and I can just pick up passively all the information that you typed on it. Uh, some of them are encrypted, however the encryption they chose to use was terrible. <laughs> uh, that's only just the listening part. Uh, and the transmitting side of things, if you want to transmit, um, you can transmit and you can infiltrate and send your data into, a key into the computer dongle like as if you're a keyboard. You just act like, it just acts like a keyboard and you're done. We've heard a little bit of the encrypted versions. Well, they're safer, right? No, they're not. Uh, you can actually send unencrypted data to an encrypted keyboard connection and it accepts it. Uh, long story short, if, you, if this thing finds data when you move your mouse or you type on your keyboard, you're vulnerable and you should remove it immediately. Sammy Kamkar is a prominent security researcher, and we asked him to explain what side channel analysis so, is. Uh, a side channel is basically uh, a channel where there may be some information that might be accidentally leaked, or you could potentially extract information that you wouldn't intentionally mean to. So let's say I have a mobile phone, just a, a cell phone. Maybe I can show you one here. I take a phone, and I can set it next to the computer. And if I have something like the microphone on, the microphone in our phones can listen to not only the audio, the audio range that humans can hear, but it can actually listen to a little bit outside of human hearing into the ultrasound. Well, things like capacitors that are on every electronic device actually produce ultrasound when they're being used. So if you're using more power, the capacitor is going to be used more and will actually produce ultrasound that your phone can then hear. Your phone can record that information and say, oh, this, at this moment, I'm using more ultra, there's more ultrasound high, with a higher amplitude than the moment before. And with that information, you can potentially extract information such as the key or the data that was being encrypted in the first place, even though the encryption algorithm might be, to what we know, perfect today. There may be no known vulnerabilities in the algorithm, but we have this side channel of other information just in our physical universe a uh, natural phenomenon that we can then exploit. Joe Grand has been creating devices for hardware hackers for many years. We caught up with him to get his thoughts on how to break into hardware through well-known access so, points. A lot of security problems cross the, the boundaries of what products are out there. Um, and by that I mean there's a lot of similarities of different classes of problems across all devices. Uh, and it's sort of also what I call low-hanging fruit. So we see a lot of exposed UART interfaces a lot of exposed JTAG interfaces and other debug interfaces, um, a lot of test points on circuit boards, and a lot of part markings on circuit boards, and things that make it easy for legitimate design engineers and for manufacturing, uh, but then also easy for attackers. So it's sort of one of these trade-offs of you know, security versus convenience, and when you're manufacturing, especially when you're manufacturing in high volume, any time you can save during that process equals money. And devices that are also just based on microcontrollers and other types of, of peripherals that don't have security built in. Uh, and we can't really expect engineers to learn about security and properly implement it because that's not really what engineers kind of do. You know, we're worried about designing systems um, on time, make sure they work under budget. Uh, security is just another level of that and you can't just patch it on at the end, but that's usually what happens. As you build your product, you make sure it works and then somebody adds security on top, but that doesn't work. Um, unless you build security in from the beginning, that's the good step. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be secure, but at least it's better. Uh, and that's a hard thing. And even as an engineer, like all the products I've designed, uh, I don't de design security in from the beginning. It's just too hard to do. And until chip vendors build security into their parts to the point where 
the engineer doesn't even have to think about it. Uh, we're going to continue to see a lot of these low-hanging fruit, a lot of these really easy problems. We traveled to DEF CON to talk to people who work in the security industry about where they think the threats are. We asked Joe Fitzpatrick for a final thought on the future of hardware device security. The, the, the difference, I think the way I've described it is potentiality versus actuality. The potential is there for us to make tiny little devices that do bad things. The reality of the situation is we don't have a good grasp of what real situations have actually occurred at this point.